Hey friends, welcome back to the channel. We are taking a guided tour of the Pillsbury factory today, so I will let him do the talking, but before we get started, here is a picture of the former employees who got together to take a photo. I just wanted to give everybody a little bit of a feel for some of the dangers that can creep up on you here at Pillsbury, especially in the night, but at, in 15 feet into a pool of nasty water and debris. And beyond that is the stairwell that everybody's trying to get to to get up top when they trespass. We know this because we found trespassers' backpacks and clothes laying right there as they shimmy their way through here. So this is one of the problems that we have and why it's important to us to get this resolved sooner rather than later before somebody oh, gets seriously sorry. injured. Yeah. Yep, so again, here in the sea mill we've got a full basement. The basement was filled with mechanical machinery uh, what I understand from the former employees is that in the later years, this was kind of used as a spare part storehouse for a lot of the electric motors and that sort of thing. So the scrap metal guys saw this as a high value place to get stuff out of and, and recycle. So they cut this hole in the floor and they were in the process of using block and tackle like this. The small concrete building, that's the truck grain dump. So in the summertime, when we had weed harvest here in central Illinois, farmers from 60 to 100 mile radius around Springfield would bring their grain right here to the Pillsbury Mill because it was a direct market. They could sell their grain directly to the processor and get the best price for their grain. So this facility had an economic impact that impacted everywhere in central Illinois. I'm told that during the summer harvest, give a hootie blow about this facility. facility they don't care yeah. it's water is actually the person that is most is responsible in the flour milling process to take the the wheat right from the bins and 
clean it and prepare it to be milled. On the smutter's chalkboard, that's what they used to work with all the employees and communicate. I took an employee up there that worked up there in October of last year, and he showed me the chalkboard and in faint chalk, it was still written. May 24th, 2001, 2.30 p.m. Cargill flour milling in Springfield is history. And it was signed with a stylized, closed-eyed, frowny face. With all the emotion that goes with that in the head, head smutters chalk writing. Now we've since got that board. We've got it for exhibit. We'll, we'll exhibit it at some point in the future. So we've got it in a safe place. But that's how we know exactly when milling stopped here that afternoon. So that was 22 plus years ago now. We're, we're right at 22 years. Lots happened in 22 years. The plant was sold by, marketed by Cargill for several years. And by 2008, when there was no buyer, they sold it for scrap and the scrap metal guys did what they did. And they pulled out the two sets of tracks that were in here. They took the metal roof that used to be on here about 20 feet high between those metal brackets and lots and lots of other metal. And they got themselves in trouble with asbestos. And that's what led to where we are today. So some of the things I get asked about, and, and if anybody's got a flashlight they can, or they can borrow mine, you can look at the, the uh, the elevator process, the, the old grain belts are still in there and you can see some of the funnels from the 16 foot diameter uh, silos. You can see how it, it flowed. I also see the sun's on a good spot here where we can talk about the construction. So some of the old timers have told us how these were constructed in a continuous concrete pour in the 20s and 30s. And you can see the ribbing there. They used, with the way the sun is, it's really good right now. You can see they put horizontal one by sixes in a circle, poured the concrete, slid them up, poured the concrete, continually slid them up until they were 105 feet tall. So these were done by hand by a concrete plant that was actually built where our cars are parked at the south end of the plant. <clears throat> Off the rail line next door, they brought in 50,000 tons of sand and gravel and 30,000 barrels of concrete mix. And that's what they mixed the old part of it at the plant to build the old part of the plant. And then later on, they brought in all the same materials for these north silos. Um, but they're getting all kinds of good questions that are prompting me to have remember you, some have, things. Have you identified companies or people who know how to water glassy asbestos? We have. Okay, yep. just... Yep. I actually had a couple of uh, uh, specialty demolition contractors here in town this past week. Okay. And we walked aside and discussed some of the techniques we intend to use. Because how long does it take to do something, something that's massive? About four months. Oh, wow. To water blast all the silver paint off and another three to four months to tear them down. I have had him tell me. The wind was too loud here, but what he was saying was that if he had all the money, that they could complete this project within a year. <laughs> yeah. So, all right. So, we're standing at the bottom of the head house. Again, the head house is built in 1929 with the old part of the plant. You can kind of lean in and take a look. 
in the head house in each of the four corners, there are big grain belts and scoops that take the grain from the grain pit in the middle up 180 feet to the top. And that's where it then get distributed. This is one of the more dangerous areas of Pillsbury because there's two feet of monkey water in the bottom of the head house on the floor. And then the pit goes down another 30 feet in the middle. It's hard to tell where that pit is in the monkey water, but there's a big pit down there. Lord knows what's at the bottom after all these years. I've had a couple of great questions. What was the peak employment of Pillsbury at any time in its history? And that was about 1,500 employees in the early 1950s before the forklifts came to Pillsbury, when they were still moving most of the product around by hand on carts. That was the most labor intensive time for the facility. As a matter of fact, I've looked at old seniority lists, which we now have, thanks to several of the uh, retirees, and there was almost no hiring that went on at Pillsbury between 1953 and 1963 because all of those employees were getting absorbed. Um, you know, they, those jobs were all the hand lifting and maneuvering, those jobs were getting retooled to other places in the plant and they weren't hiring any new people for about a 10 year period. So it's interesting when you see that. I've, I now have a, an employee seniority list from January of 1974. So if you've got a loved one that worked here at that time, uh, we're, we're going to post that on our website sometime soon. It's about eight, eight big pages, I think. And uh, you'll be able to see where all the people uh, fell on the seniority list. I've also got one from the late 1940s. I think it's 1946. And it's got the really old timers on it that started in uh, 1929. I will say on the 1974 list, there are still a good number of people that had started employment here in 1930. So this was a place where people truly did stay for a long, long time. This is also a place where I'm, I'm glad to say, if you want a brick, or more than one brick, <laughs> you can take it. anywhere along here is the best opportunity to pick your favorite brick. <laughs> We've got about three or four styles of brick here, and we're not, not, not bashful at all about having them go out the front gate in somebody's hand that really wants one. So take as many as you like. We've got plenty.
in there there's actually a metal layer. You can you can see it it's kind of faint. I know my flashlight's not good and the sun's not right. But there's a, a metal lay that's been there. It's actually got a patent date of 1897. It's about a 12 foot metal lathe for turning metal piping and and making metal pipes. And, and actually one of the guys that's a retiree has the patent tag off of it. But it's clearly been there since uh, the middleman end operation. So, yeah, yeah. And there's, you know, several more benches, and then they have a, a school just the last week of So as we're walking through here, I figure it is worth mentioning that I did have a serious headache by the time we were done with this tour. I don't know if that has anything to do with the asbestos issue, but just a fair warning if anybody wants to go visit, I definitely was not feeling well by the end of it.
you have to use specialized techniques and equipment to harvest those. Yeah. And the idea is where's the right price point where they work. Uh, you know, what it costs you to get them out of there. But we are going to try to save as many of these heavy beams as we can as this building then comes down in the next few months. But it's a shame, but again, there was an arson fire here about five years ago, and, wow. and the upstairs is dramatically charred. So, again, this connects up with the rest of, of the plant directly on the inside, and this is on a concrete slab. But this is really a last opportunity for this building because it's as soon as we get the money freed up, this is the this is next on the list, along with that locker room. Building. So the last stop on our tour is going to be out back, about 50 feet to the left. We'll take a look at the rail yard to get a good broad side look at the whole mill, and we'll talk a little bit about our civil defense siren. And it's getting harvested off the roof of the head house in the next month or two. Uh, it'll be taken down and reverted okay, uh, by a young man, 16 years old. And he's a hobbyist and works for the Civil Defense Siren Hobby Group. And we've been working with him to get that off of our roof. It's been up there since 1956 and, uh, and re repurposed. Uh, before we tear it down, so it can be, yeah. Once it's refurbished, it can go back into use in a community that needs it. Yep. So we'll gather up out there. We'll take a look at the broadside. It's a really good photo opportunity. You can see how close we are to the rail yard and how we connect to the rail yard. And we'll talk a little bit about the civil defense siren and the shelter that Pillsbury used to be. Ferry property from the fence. Out to just about where my left shoulder's at. And that's where the missing tracks are. Because the scrap metal guy's got all the tracks that were here. But this 50 feet beyond the fence belongs to Pillsbury. And this is where you can see where our four sets of tracks used to go in. Rail cars would come right from this rail yard, right in here. And the grain would get dumped into the grain pits back there below those pit house is what it's called. Get augered into the head house, up in the head house, and then redistributed. So this is where the, all the grain would come in by rail. This, this is the Illinois and Midland Rail Yard. It's been here since the 1920s, since before Pillsbury was built, and a lot of the Pillsbury's building materials came in right off the rail yard. Uh, you can see a great kind of eastern broadside so we're at the southeast corner of the property but you know you get a full you know this is warehouse number one that's going to be torn down shortly turbo building a b mill with the glass block and of course all the silos on the north end so it's a pretty good photo shot from what so from where i'm standing too you can get a great view of our civil defense siren those of us of a certain age remember the Cold War and the onset of the, the whole idea of nuclear annihilation. Our civil defense siren was put in place in 1956. We've got a hobbyist group uh, that we're working with that, that told us that. We've gone up, we've read the serial number. Ours is serial number 900 out of about 15,000 federal signal sirens that were made in Chicago. They're distributed all across the country throughout the 1950s primarily. Ours is unique. It's one of the largest models they ever made. It's got a three and a half foot horn on it. It's got a supercharger. It's run with a 10 horse motor. Um, it's a pretty impressive siren and of course it operated until just about 20 years ago when it was replaced with the electronic one that's out at the southwest corner of our property on the 60 foot steel pole out there which is all electronic this one's all mechanical we're going to harvest it off there in the next month or so it's going to get refurbished and it will either get put on display 
or it will get repurposed in a community that needs a civil defense siren. A lot of small towns still use these old style civil defense sirens because they were built stout enough that they're they're really they can be used after 70 years. So this is really a last look at that because sometime in the next few weeks it's gonna exit the scene after about what 70 plus years I guess. But um, Hillsbury was also used as a civil defense shelter. So that same era, 50s, 60s, and into the 70s, we used to supply heavy concrete buildings in strategic areas with, you know, food, clothing, cots, all that sort of thing. Our sea mill basement, that's the one where we looked into the big pit into the basement. That was an official U.S. civil defense shelter. So people that lived in this area, Springfield, knew to come to that, come to Pillsbury and shelter there if the sirens arbor went off and we did have a nuclear situation. So that's another piece of the Pillsbury history uh, that'll be lost here before too long. So we're, again, we're trying to capture that. We've got one of the civil defense shelter signs uh, in storage as well. That really concludes the formal part of our tour. And that's it, guys. Thank you so much for watching. Please don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and I'll see you all next time.